Welcome back to our series on transformational leaderships. In our last session, we were reminded that if we want to make a difference in our world, then first of all, we must have a passion. Uh, what is the passion that God has given you? What is the injustice in our world that you want to stand against to bring about hope for those who are hopeless? Uh, then we began to discuss we must lead with excellence. It's not just enough for us to have a passion, but we must be excellent. We must be competent in all that we're doing if we hope to make a difference. Uh, there are five practices that relate to this idea of, of excellence, and it was a result of international research that tried to find those companies or the organizations that were good organizations but became even better, uh, those that made a difference in their society or in the arena and of business in which they were serving. Uh, these five practices, yesterday, in the last session, we, we looked at the one that modeling the way. Uh, if we're going to make a difference, then, then we must... We must model the way. Uh, how can we lead people to a place where we ourselves have never been? Then in this session today, I want us to look at the other four of these practices. We'll have to go through them very quickly, but you can go back through our workbook and through the textbook and, and get further explanation about it. The second is inspire a shared vision. We first model the way, and then we must inspire a shared vision. Uh, that's the first one that we'll begin with. And then we'll look at the idea of challenging the process and enabling others to act and encouraging the heart. The, the whole idea of inspiring a shared vision. Uh, in, when Jesus had already been to the cross and was raised from the dead and was ascending back to the Father, he took that small group of disciples that were around him. And this is what he told them. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Well, that was an impossible dream. How can this ragtag group of followers make an impact on the whole world when most of them were just Galileans themselves? And yet, that's the vision that God gave them. God said, you're going to be my witnesses, and you're going to take this message of hope to the very ends of the earth. What, what is your inspiration, or what, what is your vision? The power of vision is for us to be able to envision the future by imagining exciting and ennobling possibilities. When we talk about the, the burden that we have for, for these, the injustice that's in our world, uh, what would it take to overcome that injustice? We looked at Martin Luther King Jr. in America who wanted to get rid of the segregation laws that created two classes of citizens. We talked about William Wilberforce. He wanted a world that was free from slavery, a world where no one would be sold to be used as a tool uh, for, at the expense of other people. The power of vision, if we can, in, in, in our own mind, if we can see a world beyond that injustice that seems to imperil so many, then that's the beginning of vision. Visualization, if we're going to visualize uh, this, this new world or this new reality, there are two really important principles. One of them has to do with these three circles or three questions that we will look into. But the second one is just a very simple thing in that how do you take this vision and how do you translate it into a simple concept? Well, let's, let's look at these, these uh, three questions. Uh, the, the three questions are, what stirs your greatest passion? When you're at your best, what are your resources? Those are the three questions. Now, you ask those questions of yourself, uh, and so try to answer that very honestly. When you say, what stirs my greatest passion? Uh, identify that in your own heart. And then when you say, when am I at my very best? Not what would I like to be best at, but, but what are those things when I am at my best? And then what are the resources? Sometimes our impact uh, relates very directly to what the resources are that are available. But not only do you ask those questions of yourself, but if you're a manager of a company, or if you're a leader of a nonprofit, or if you're a pastor of a congregation, ask these same questions uh, to them, uh, about them, that you ask questions. So if, if your organization, you ask, what's the passion of our organization? Uh, when is our organization at its best? And what are our resources? But let's look at these individually. 
The first question was, what are your passions? Uh, when I've led organizations or groups, I bring them together. We put a big circle on the screen and we begin to write these out. What are we passionate about? And so we begin to list all of these things about which we are passionate. But then we go through, we begin to narrow the list down and say, you know, what are, what are the 10 most things or what are the five most things or what are the two or three things that we're most passionate about? Well, when you're answering this question, you cannot manufacture passion or motivate people to feel passionate. We can only discover what ignites our passion and the passions of those around us. Also, there are some things about which all organizations should feel passionate about, like integrity. And then a third thing is, what passions are unique to our organization? What are the things about, about my life and our organization that, that make us unique and make us different from, from any of the others? Well, the second question um, has to do with when we are at our best. Uh, some of the things that you will ask in trying to determine where you're your best, the, the principles of, of these three circles that we're talking about, this, this is not a goal to be best. It's not a strategy to be the best. It's not an intention to be the best or, or plan to be the best. It's an understanding of when we are at our best. Clarify that. Uh, then, then the second thing, the three questions require a severe standard of excellence. It's, it, it's about uh, building on strength and, and, and competence, about understanding what our organization truly has the potential to be. So the three questions, first, uh, what are we passionate about? And second, when are we at our best? Well, the third question then that we answer is about our resources. What, what is our personal and what is our corporate resource engine? Now, the denominator can be quite subtle. Uh, sometimes it might even be unobvious what our resources might be. But the key is to use the question of the denominator to gain an understanding and insight into our resource model. Uh, for us to be able to accomplish great things and, and make a difference in the world, society, then, then as we identify our passion and, and as we identify those things that we do best, then what are those resources? They may be human resources, the personnel around you. They may be financial resources. Uh, they may be changes of culture. Uh, so really identify what these resources are as we try to envision uh, 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 the possibilities that are before us. Uh, the resource engine is, it's many times complacent organizations just don't ask the right questions. Uh, they set their goals and their strategies more from bravado rather than understanding. Now, this, this is the most evident when many organizations have a mindless pursuit of growth. So rather than trying to understand how the technology, how uh, the, the situations of the world, the changes or shifts in economy, rather than those being different for us, uh, then, then we need to identify and, and not just keep doing what we've always done. If we keep doing what we've always done, then we will miss those tremendous opportunities that open to us, many times coming even out of challenge. Well, effective leaders uh, develop a personal vision of greatness for themselves, and then they coach others uh, to develop their own visions of greatness for their work. Effective leaders uh, are some questions that you might ask uh, to help you to be able to coach your team would be, in the best of all worlds, what individually ask your staff or, or, your, or your team, what is the great performance in your current position? Uh, a second question is, what do you want to achieve? Individually ask them and then corporately ask your team, what would you like to achieve in the next two to three years? Uh, it's very important that we ask, uh, how can we measure our performance? Uh, what are the things that we're doing that are working well, and what are the things that we're doing that, that are not working well? What things do you need to learn in order to reach that goal, that dream that's in front of you? And what, what uh, work experiences do we need to learn in order to help us to achieve our goals? Uh, Many times our vision can come out of suffering. 
Uh, we, we saw that from Martin Luther King Jr. Just, uh, it cost him. He saw a world that was not judged by the color of skin. It was like he, he had seen what could be the possibility in the future. And yet he knew the struggle to get there was going to be arduous and, and it oftentimes even painful. Even the night before he died, Martin Luther King Jr. said, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. We, as a people, will get to the promised land. How can we look beyond suffering and, 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 and come to the place where we can see a vision of a new world, a, a new hope, a new reality, and then how can we engage our team to move with us in bringing about that common goal? So the second practice then is envision a shared vision. Uh, a, a shared, the first one was model the way. How do we model the way? The second one is, is inspire a shared vision. And then the third one has to do with challenging the process. This is the best practice that leaders must challenge the process. One saying is, how do we keep the memories while leaving the memorabilia behind? Uh, so often we just hang on to all the systems and all the programs and all the stories of the past. And we find ourselves living in, in, in an old reality rather than embracing the, the tremendous opportunities that are in front of us. Our world is in the midst of this horrific uh, pan pandemic where uh, everything is stopped. Uh, merchandising stopped. Travel stopped. Uh, many things are, have been frozen in place. As we move beyond the pandemic, what is the new world that we live in? Uh, what has changed? What have we learned during this crisis that will help us to become more uh, efficient and, and, and productive in, in the new world in, in which we live? Well, what we need to do in order to monitor change is what's taking place in the social sector? What's going on politically that may change the way we live and think and act? What about technology? We've learned during the pandemic that, that much technology has changed as people, rather than going to an office to work, many times have been working out of their own homes. Economically, what are the new realities? We can't pretend that we live under an old economy. What, what are the realities of the new economy that shape who we are and what we do? But then also artistic. I think it's very important. What are the stories that are being told? What are the images that now communicate? What are the mediums through which we're able to, to gain our understandings? We need to be able to anticipate change. Not just react to change, but how do we look into the future and, and begin to, to dream about what is taking place? Let me ask you this. What major changes do you see forthcoming in the next decade? The changes that will shape the future of your ministry. Another question, how can you lead your organization or your team to create the future instead of waiting for these external pressures uh, to shape you? Uh, well, if we're going to implement change, then, then during the pandemic, we've seen an example of that uh, in, in the U.S., uh, there was a real problem of, of food insecurity for our children. Many of our children got their meals at school. And so when they went to school, they had breakfast there and then they had lunch there. But when there was no longer any schools, many of the people who lived in impoverished lives, they didn't have access to food. They, they didn't have a breakfast or they didn't have a lunch. It was most difficult for those who lived out in the rural areas of, of, of our country. And so there was a, a, a collaboration with a nonprofit, the Texas Hunger Initiative, and then a, a far profit, the McLean Global Company, and then also the government, the government offerings. They came together and they collaborated. How can we get food to these children who are out in these remote parts of our country? How can we feed them? Well, they were able to put together a plan within weeks because they had already anticipated such a challenge that might one day be before them. And they were able to deliver 44 million meals to children 
who otherwise uh, would have been food insecure. We've got to search for opportunities. Uh, what are the opportunities that will help us to excel? Make a list of all the practices and procedures and policies uh, in, in your church or your team or your organization or your company that, that meet this description. That's the way we've always done it before. <laughs> How many times have we heard that? We try to do something new and innovative, and, and there are those voices that have been around for a long time, and, and they, they continue to ask the question, well, why are you doing this? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, if you keep doing things the way you've always done them, then you'll keep getting the kind of results that you've always gotten. And so if, if you anticipate making change in, in your industry or, or in, in our communities, then we've got to be able to anticipate it. For each one of these, ask the question, how useful is this, this practice that we've been doing? How useful is this for helping us become uh, the best that we can become? How, do, how, do we, how does this help us to serve all of our congregation? The, the answer is, is almost too obvious, and it's, it's very simple. If what you're doing works, then if it's essential, keep it. But if it's not essential, then we have the privilege of trying to find a better way. We search for opportunities by uh, pretend you're brand new at your job as a leader of your organization and, and walk around, uh, wander around to the rest of your staff and, and ask some dumb questions uh, like, why do we do this? Or uh, why do we handle this in this manner? And get them to answer us. Or we, we experiment and we take risks by constantly trying to generate small wins and learning from our experience. Well, we need to honor our risk takers. We want those around us who are on our team who are willing to try something new and take a risk. We need to analyze our failures. After we've been involved in, in, in an opportunity, then we, we ask the question, did this work or did this not work? If it didn't work, why did it not work? And if it did work, what were the reasons for which it was successful? Try to provide an environment that's free from uh, adverse consequences for failures because if we're going to operate in the arena of faith, then we know that we're going to be operating in an arena where we take risk. Uh, when we're creating a team that we work with, we need to be reminded that we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, Moses, the great leader of the Hebrew people who led them out of exile, uh, after the children of Israel had been released from their Egyptian captivity, uh, Moses was trying to lead these few million people all by himself. And his father-in-law came to him and said, that's crazy, Moses, you can't do that. You, you, you've got to delegate. You, you've got to, to raise up people who will help you to, to, to bear this, this burden. Uh, th that's exactly the same kind of thing that William Wilberforce did when they worked toward the abolition of slavery. He couldn't do that by himself. And so he enlisted others like Hannah Moore, uh, who was the writer, the journalist, the, the writer of plays and novels. He enlisted people like Isaac Newton, the, the academic, or, or John Newton, who was the preacher. Uh, we can't make great change, and we can't overcome injustices by ourselves. There must be a team around us. Uh, leaders know that uh, collaboration is essential. Uh, a, a leader by, by himself or herself uh, can't make extraordinary things happen. You know, it, it takes partners. So leaders invest in building uh, spirited and cohesive teams uh, that, that feel like a family, uh, a, a community uh, uh, together. They develop collaborative goals and cooperative relationships uh, with colleagues. They know these relationships are the key to unlock support. Now, sometimes uh, these simple truths from these successful leaders is very simple. You know, we begin with the question of who rather than what. If you're building a team, who are the people that you want around you? Who are the ones that can adapt uh, to a changing world? We also want to make sure that we have the right people on the bus. 
the problem of, of how to motivate and manage people primarily goes away if you've got the right people on your team and the right people who are moving with you. If you have the wrong people on the team, then it doesn't matter whether you discover the right direction or not, you still won't have a great company or a great institution. Great vision without great people is actually irrelevant. Now, three disciplines uh, we, that we must be rigorous rather than, than ruthless. When you're putting your team together, when you hire, when in doubt, if you're interviewing someone, when you have doubts about them, don't hire. Keep, keep looking. When you know you need to make a personnel change, act. If you know in your heart this person is not working out, you're not using their gifts, they don't have a passion for what you have a passion about, you need to move, then make a change. It's very important that we put our best people on our biggest opportunities. Sometimes we put our best people on those that are our biggest problems. Well, th that's a waste of resources. We, for our biggest opportunities, we need to engage our best people. Well, uh, we need to say, and enable others by saying we, and, 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 and uh, ask questions and listen and take advice. Uh, we, we need to stop talking uh, and start building in our staff meetings. Uh, we need to think of a time when we were most successful and, and then and, uh, uh, be able to, to uh, challenge them to, to, to be able to do that ourselves. So, so the, the, the enabling others to act is, is, is the third of these principles. Now, encouraging the heart uh, is, is, is the next principle. And that's how do we encourage our team members um, to encourage the heart, everyone wants to feel that he or she is part of a team, uh, that their contributions are valuable and enabled. We want to look at encouraging ideas. Uh, we, we make our recognitions public. So when someone has done some, some excellent work, then, then celebrate that. Uh, let the whole team, think, give them credit for what they've done and, and celebrate the, the, uh, the achievement or the accomplishment that they've had. Celebrate, uh, 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 schedule celebrations and demonstrate caring uh, while you wander around and, and have fun. Uh, when someone personally recognizes and reward, uh, then, then they begin to build on that and that encourages them to be, uh, to be their best selves. Ask them, uh, when they reflect on when they were recognized, what made that time so, uh, so memorable? Making extraordinary things happen in organizations uh, is, it's hard work. Uh, leaders uh, must encourage their followers to go the distance, uh, not, not just to, to do the things that are, 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 are maybe appear to be the most urgent. Well, it's going to take courage for us uh, to lead uh, through times of, of difficulty and challenge. We need encouragement because we're going to always face, we're going to face criticism. Uh, in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily en 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 encumbers us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the, at the right hand of God. Martin Luther King Jr. again said, you know, the world just doesn't like people like Gandhi. Uh, that's strange. I mean, Gandhi was one who led his own people. And as a result, he ended up being killed by one of his own countrymen. Martin Luther King said, the world doesn't like people like Gandhi. That's strange. They don't like people like Christ. They don't like people like Abraham Lincoln from the United States. Uh, they, they killed him. This man who'd done all that good for India, who, who gave his life and mobilized and galvanized 400 million people for independence, one of his fellow Hindus felt that he was too favorable to the Muslims. He was a man of nonviolence, falling at the hands of a man 
who is filled with hate. Challenges, criticism, we can expect opposition, but it's worth it if by the grace of God, we can be a part of bringing justice to a world that's filled with injustice.